Our next talk is going to be about open networking and a solution that Attila and his team is doing for having uh, open hardware and open software in data centers and how that will look in the future. Uh, give a well, warm welcome to Attila de Groot and enjoy this talk. Thank you. So, um, a few people might know me for organizing uh, uh, here at SHA, um, but during the day I also have a day job. Uh, I work for Cumulus Networks, and uh, today I'm uh, talking a bit about open networking, uh, how that evolves around Cumulus, uh, and hardware, software, and data center network design. So. Um, uh, 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 Cumulus was founded about seven years ago, so I don't really want to call it a startup anymore. Um, but one of the things was that if you look at uh, typical data center networking, that the uh, large, uh, well, uh, providers don't really use typical uh, hardware anymore. So if you have a classical enterprise using Cisco, VMware, uh, and EMC for your storage, uh, that's very classical. But if you then look at a uh, Google, Facebook, uh, they typically do it differently. For example, Google and both Facebook, they wrote their own operating system uh, that runs on top of their switches, uh, and uh, that works better with the applications uh, that they are running, and it integrates more well uh, in their processes. Um, now, the thing is that most companies, if you're not a Google, then you don't have the capacity uh, or resources to actually develop an own operating system on top of your switches. Um, now, th that is the idea what Cumulus does. So instead of buying uh, a box that comes with an operating system and um, basically is quite closed, uh, you buy a box, so you have the freedom to uh, choose your own hardware, including cables, optics, and so on. And on top of that, you, um, uh, you uh, uh, get a not network operating system. Of course, uh, Cumulus pr uh, uh, prefers if you use uh, Cumulus Linux, but there are a few uh, other operating systems around. And the idea is that the flexibility of uh, choosing your own operating system makes it also fl uh, more flexible to integrate it with the applications that you uh, are using. Now first, uh, let us have a bit of look at the hardware uh, that is available. So um, in my position, uh, I'm an SE, so, uh, which means that I uh, report to the sales department. But the idea is that I help customers um, uh, to choose their network and help design it and so on. Um, and one question that I simply uh, get is like, okay, do I buy some fake Chinese hardware and how does that actually work? Um, if you look at uh, data center switches, um, then basically there is not much difference between either a brand or a white box switch. Um, most of the uh, data center switches run on Broadcom hardware these days, about uh, 95%. And uh, uh, there are only six ODMs in the world that actually make the hardware. So, uh, for example, if you look at Edgecore, uh, they are part uh, or a subsidiary of the Ecton Group. Um, that same ODM also makes hardware for named vendors. So that means that you get exactly the same hardware, it just has a different color or uh, doesn't have any labeling. Um, but it all runs on that same chipset, um, so it can do exactly the same. Now, uh, one thing is that uh, most white boxes until beginning of this year um, didn't come in a chassis model. Now, if you're building large-scale networks, uh, it might be preferred to actually have a chassis. Uh, I'll get into the design parts later. Um, uh, but the problem is with classical chassis that they have proprietary blades and uh, network processors uh, and simply don't have the architecture open that allows other operating systems to be installed on it. Now, Facebook uh, made a change in that. Uh, they released the design of their backpack chassis, and uh, these are some photos that I took in our lab when I was in the US. And what you're seeing is a 128-port, 100-gig uh, chassis, and basically it is a, a box with multiple switches in it. So on the right side, you see uh, one of the line cards, 
It has two ASICs, two Broadcom ASICs. And um, you have front-facing ports, and uh, on the back you also have a connector. And what it does, uh, on the right side you see that same blade again, and you uh, basically push it into another blade on the back, which means that you uh, can create line rate forwarding again. Um, so you also have to manage it, in this case this box, as eight uh, different uh, switches. Now, if you then look at the architecture, um, they call it a, a spine in a box or, or uh, a class in a box because uh, you see all the line cards and it's connected as such that you have that full line rate connections. Um, so for an operating system, if you're installing that, um, if I uh, go back to your previous slide, you see uh, eight modules on the front, and that means if you, for example, run Cumulus on it, you have eight instances of Cumulus Linux running on top of that. So if you're managing your network, uh, automation is quite key here, um, because you don't want to ma manage all of those uh, instances uh, by itself. Now, if we then look a bit on uh, Cumulus Linux uh, and the software part of it, um, uh, we are based on Debian Jesse, and uh, we also use everything that comes with it. Um, and you could say that, uh, for example, Cisco NXOS or Arista is uh, running on top of uh, Linux kernel as well. Uh, that is true, but they have their own user space applications that are handling all the uh, network uh, functions. Um, what we are doing, all the forwarding, uh, we use the uh, Linux kernel for that. And what we basically added is a switching daemon. And that switching daemon looks at the uh, kernel netlink messages and programs the hardware. Um, now, if you actually want to get that information into the Linux kernel, for example, if you want to do routing, um, you can do, uh, use Quagga or um, actually a fork of that, which is free range routing. And you can use that to set up your routing protocols. So uh, OSPF, BGP, uh, and so on. Um, now, uh, our customers or uh, anyone using it, uh, they have the freedom to also choose a different routing suite. Um, for example, if they're not happy about Quagga uh, or if it doesn't uh, fit their needs, then they can also install Bird. Uh, something happened, uh, for example, here on the camp. Uh, we were testing and we run into something specific and uh, they just had the freedom to choose another routing uh, daemon. Um, which means that you have that flexibility. Now, one of the uh, key things, if you uh, look at the network operating system these days, uh, either from a normal vendor or uh, Cumulus Linux, is that you want to automate your network, simply because uh, it's not feasible to manage all devices manually anymore. Now, what is specific about uh, Cumulus is that it's a regular Linux uh, distribution, so you can use your standard tools like Ansible, Puppet, and so on which makes it a lot more uh, easier to manage. And I'll get back to that in a bit. Now, also the monitoring. Uh, typically, we've been monitoring networks with SNMP, um, but SNMP is based on ASN1, which has uh, um, yeah, not all the functionalities that we would like to have. Now, because it's a standard Linux box, you can also install your monitor the same monitoring tools that you're using on your servers already. Um, and I think that's more easier to integrate because you have the same configuration that you uh, can also use on your box, uh, on your servers. Um, so w what we see is that sometimes uh, people just treat it like a server that happens to have 48 ports, and you can manage it then uh, with uh, pushing out data with Collect D uh, to um, yeah, a time series database like InfluxDB and uh, do your monitoring in that way. Now, uh, one of the things uh, wh uh, what Cumulus does in uh, the open source world, um, because uh, pretty much most of what we develop is upstreamed. So we d uh, upstream a lot of the development that we do on the Linux kernel. Um, for example, VRF support that simply didn't exist for the Linux kernel. Uh, there were some attempts with namespaces, but if you look at uh, white box switching and large scale networking, then using namespaces on your boxes, that doesn't provide scalability. So VRF support is in the 4.9 kernel, uh, 
uh, and I believe in the latest Ubuntu release that's also included. Uh, of course, uh, Quagga and free range routing. Uh, if you have uh, followed a bit the development of Quagga, um, that didn't progress very well over the last uh, few years. So Cumulus, were, were together with a dozen other companies, they decided that it was good to make a fork, uh, something that you don't really want to do unless uh, absolutely necessary. But that fork is free-range routing, and it includes all the routing protocols, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good to use. Also, uh, I have UpDown2. Uh, if you've ever worked with uh, Debian, for example, and you do a, a network reload, uh, you see a message that it might not work. Um, now, that is one of the reasons uh, that we developed our own network manager, because that is something that you don't want to do. Um, for example, I have UpDown1 doesn't have a partial reload, and if you have a network box, you don't want to reload all the ports affecting uh, every uh, connection that you have. Now, uh, one of the things if uh, I'm talking to people and uh, talking to the community, uh, you also have to explain data center network design. Um, because basically you're coming with a new concept of open networking, and uh, the last network refresh was maybe 10 years ago. And then, okay, what are you going to build, and how are you going to build your network? Um, if there's anyone with a network background who did any uh, type of certification, uh, this diagram is pretty standard. Um, it has an access distribution and core layer, and that's based on a time where applications were uh, very uh, uh, server to client uh, uh, centric. <coughs> um, if you configured something like that, uh, your network was, full, uh, was fully layer two. Uh, it was based on having spanning tree, or if you were lucky, then you had MLAC. Um, but that was all based on proprietary protocols, and that limited scalability. So what you do these days is what you do is you build a class network or a spine leaf network, and that isn't something we uh, uh, we invented. Uh, so if you look at all the vendors these days, also Cisco, Juniper, Arista, if you make a typical data center uh, network design. Uh, you built a spine leaf network. Now, one of the um, limitations of a, a classical network topology is that you have a limitation of two uh, cores. Now, if you build a spine leaf uh, network, you uh, typically start with a routing configuration, um, which means that you have routing links between all your leaf la uh, layers, which are the top of rack switches and the spines. And that means that you can balance all your traffic over multiple spines. And it's only limited by the number of ports that you have. Uh, so in this case, if you want to have six uh, spines, then sure, that's uh, perfectly possible. And you have much more bandwidth inside your data center, which you need for storage, VMs, and so on. Now. If you then look at that routing uh, configuration, how do you usually build that? Um, now, between your leaf and uh, spines, you uh, either use OSPF or uh, BGP. Although, if you uh, look at most uh, recent configurations, then BGP inside your data center is becoming the default. Uh, LinkedIn and Microsoft also uh, wrote an RFC about that. Um, and, well, BGP has been proven to be pretty scalable. And one of the advantages is that you simply don't have any spanning tree in your backbone anymore. Now, what you typically do is you uh, want to dual connect any server. Um, MLAC is uh, pretty standard to do that, uh, which means that from a server perspective, uh, the switch looks as one device. Uh, you still have to manage them separately, um, and that is how you can uh, provide redundancy for your servers. Now, one problem with uh, layer three networking and having routing in your backbone is that you don't have layer two anymore. Uh, personally, I uh, like that very much because uh, layer two uh, can uh, cause a lot of issues. Uh, the problem is that there are two cases where you actually would need layer two. And one is functionality, um, because for VMs, if you want to do a, a move from a VM from one hypervisor to the other, uh, you need to be in the same layer two domain. Uh, also, firewalls and such, they uh, still might want to use uh, layer two uh, protocols to do synchronization. So for that, uh, to, to solve that, you typically build an overlay network. Now, I'll go more into the details later, but 
Uh, the typical protocol to do that is VXLAN these days. There are several other overlay protocols. However, uh, VXLAN has become the default. Now, there is one other option. Um, this is something that we kind of introduced, uh, uh, or at least um, uh, from a marketing perspective, but it's not really new. And we call that routing to the host. And what we basically do is you install that same routing daemon, in this case, free range routing or Quagga, and you install that on your servers. So if you have all your servers running Linux, uh, you can install Quagga there as well. And that means that you don't need MLAC anymore to your switches. Um, well, uh, that could be an advantage for some people because uh, MLAC is still uh, layer two and you still have a dependencies be uh, between the two boxes. You have a daemon that is synchronizing and MLAC is also not a standard. Uh, every vendor has their own implementation of MLAC and it doesn't seem to be uh, becoming one standard. Now, what I said before, automation is quite important for us, um, and we think that's uh, the future because you simply don't want to configure everything uh, manually. So what you want to do is your uh, equipment that arrives at your data center, and from that, uh, you don't want to send an expensive engineer to connect everything. You just want to send in a ticket to remote hands to cable everything up, and from that point on, everything should be uh, automated. Now, one of the things uh, that helps here is a bootloader, uh, ONI, uh, which is the open network install environment that was developed by Cumulus, uh, because before we started, there was no uh, bootloader, and uh, getting an operating system installed, uh, uh, that was quite uh, uh, some work. Um, and ONI is basically the PXE version for switches. It's fully open sourced and uh, under the umbrella of the OCP these days. And uh, one of the advantages that it has is, for example, you boot and it does uh, DHCP requests. It automatically um, uh, installs your OS based on the DHCP option that you get. Um, and also the first time that uh, the operating system boots, you can run some scripts, uh, making sure that your configuration gets loaded. Now, Another thing for uh, automation and something that you want to do is you want to test. And how do you actually do that? Uh, sure, your vendor can provide you with four, six, maybe eight switches if you're lucky and you put in a big order. But typically you don't uh, have, in, uh, or your production network is larger than that. So what we did since we're a Linux uh, distribution, we released a, um, uh, a virtual machine. Uh, you can download that separately and you can play with the operating system. Now, uh, just having one virtual machine, if you want to test something, uh, 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 an entire network, that is not enough. So what we did is we used Vagrant uh, uh, to, uh, to define a network topology. And uh, this is a diagram of our reference topology. And you can use that to uh, fully test whatever you're doing in your uh, network. Uh, so you can set up your BGP sessions or clone your entire configuration. Um, uh, of course, you don't have hardware forwarding, uh, but that's not uh, really an issue if you're just testing your protocols. Now, obviously, this reference topology doesn't match your physical topology. So what we also did is we uh, made a topology generator. And based on a uh, diagram, you can uh, create a new uh, topology that matches your network. Uh, I did it myself for a customer or, or multiple customers. The, they said, okay, we want to test and how would it look if I would build my network? And then I just generated that diagram uh, or the topology uh, to test and uh, implement everything. Now, uh, what does that mean and how can you actually use it? And how can you automate and orchestrate your network? Now, what I already said is you can use your standard Linux DevOps tools to provision your network. Um, now, that isn't very special these days anymore. Um, of course, being a, a standard Linux operating system, that makes it a little bit easier. But uh, all other vendors have either uh, Ansible mo uh, modules or Puppet modules, so that's uh, possible as well. Now, the next step, what we're doing is basically uh, you want to manage your network in the same way that you are developing applications. Uh, 
So you want to use your infrastructure as code um, and then do continuous integration. So you have a complete copy uh, in that virtual instance of your physical network. So for, if you have a change, um, you can decide for yourself if you do only that for major changes. You fair, first push the uh, change to your virtual network. And uh, uh, if it works out well uh, with uh, automated uh, checkups, uh, you can uh, deploy it into your production network. Now, a few other things that uh, we are also doing is uh, we developed a tool that we call the Prescriptive Topology Manager. And uh, what you basically do is you load a uh, graphing file uh, where you define all your connections in. And if you deploy your new network, um, you can automatically uh, see if all the cables are connected correctly. So that means that you don't have to um, uh, send an engineer to check all the connections in your data center. Uh, you just ru uh, run the daemon, and it says, OK, um, are the connections expected, uh, or are they as I uh, have expected it? Is everything connected? Um, one of our customers, he even created the script. If he uh, deploys a new switch, automatically the daemon starts up. And if something is, um, um, is connected incorrectly, he automatically opens up a ticket for his remote hands that they didn't do their work. Um, so that is quite some, uh, that's quite nice. Now, uh, one of the other things is also because we develop on the uh, routing suite as well, is that we thought, OK, how can you improve your configuration? Because if you look at typical routing configuration, uh, you have to configure IPs on all your links, um, and you have to manage that, um, which could uh, be a lot of work. So what we did is we uh, introduced unnumbered routing protocols. Now, if you're using um, Ethernet, you simply need a next hop to actually forward your traffic. So what we did is we used the technologies and the standards that are already out there. Uh, if you configure an, uh, an interface in Linux, you already have an IP address, which is the v6 link local address. Now, uh, with v6, we have router advertisements, which means that you can advertise who you are to your neighbor. And based on that, you can automatically set up either the BGP or OSPF session. Now, that means that you have a v6 uh, routing session, uh, but there's also an RFC uh, to uh, announce your v4 addresses over that v6 session and then forward your traffic. Now, th this means that there is nothing proprietary about it. Um, and because there are, in the past, there have been some fabric configurations and such um, that, uh, well, I personally pr uh, prefer not to use. Now, if we uh, then look at the monitoring part, which I already explained, um, I think it makes it much more easier not to use SNMP anymore. So you can integrate it, get much more data from your uh, device that isn't included in SNMP. Uh, for example, values that aren't supported by ASN1. Um, yeah, that makes it much more easier to integrate that. Because a lot of companies, they implement a new network, but they forgot to ha uh, that they have to manage and monitor it afterwards. Now, one of the things that I also want to explain is the overlay networking um, and what that exactly is. Because for, uh, from a viewpoint, if you're not a networking guy, most people just say, give me an IP address, and I just want to reach my destination. And I don't care what you do with your network. Just make sure that my packets arrive. Um, now, but what we want from a network side is uh, we want to have a stable network, but the user doesn't really care about that. Now, with overlay networking, and in this case, VXLAN tunnels, you can make sure that you have that stable backbone uh, with your routing protocols, and you build those tunnels over that uh, so that the end user still has the same that he uh, is, uh, already was used to. Um, now, what you do is uh, your server is still connected to a VLAN, and it has an IP address. And from the switch, it's hardware accelerated into a tunnel. So if you want to do 10 gig of traffic, uh, you don't me uh, have any performance degradation. Now, how does that look from a protocol overhead? Um, it is quite easy. Uh, your original Ethernet frame is encapsulated in a UDP packet and sent to the destination and then decapsulated again. Um, 
Now, I have a more uh, complicated uh, drawing of that as well. Um, but from an end user, it is uh, quite easy to use. Um, and from a network side, so uh, in your backbone, you just see UDP traffic, and it's also quite easy to debug. Now, how do you actually configure that in your network? I hope that you uh, can see the left side of this slide. Probably not. Um, but uh, what we did uh, for an, uh, networking uh, in IF Updown 2, uh, and we added a VXLAN aware um, uh, bridge in, li in the Linux kernel, which means that if you've ever configured a VLAN in Linux, you don't have to uh, configure a separate bridge for every VLAN that you have on your device. And that makes it just very uh, easy to manage. Now, on that bridge, for uh, every VLAN, you have to define a VNI. Uh, that still means that if you have a lot of VNIs, you still have to configure them separately. But that is something that we're working on as well, to have the same model as a VLAN aware bridge, to make sure that you only have to uh, define a VNI, VNI instance uh, once. Now, one issue with overlay networking is how do you um, uh, learn MAC addresses? Where, uh, where is everyone uh, in the network? You can do that with a centralized controller, uh, but that means that you have a single point of failure in your network. Now, if you look at the RFC uh, for VXLAN, um, that uses multicast replication. Now, um, for uh, some reasons, uh, uh, a lot of vendors didn't implement this at the first time, uh, but also a lot of users didn't use multicast in their backbone, probably because it's a difficult technology or that they simply have no interest for that. Uh, that means that a lot of uh, vendors implemented um, distribution of MAC addresses and address learning uh, through a technology that's called a head-end replication which basically means if there is a, a broadcast message uh, received on a switch, it's any costed to all the other switches that are interested in it. And that interested part is usually a proprietary application. Now, the problem is that you want to have integration of multiple vendors. Now, um, for that you have the eVPN standard, and uh, basically, you use BGP to, uh, to announce all your MAC addresses and uh, show uh, where every member is. Now, how does that actually work? Uh, first, you need to know uh, which switch is actually interested uh, in a tunnel endpoint. For that, you have uh, a type 3 message. You have uh, five uh, type messages to announce everything. Um, and this basically says, is, uh, okay, I'm interested in these VNIs, so if there is any broadcast message, pre uh, please send it my way. Um, so just using type 3 would be able to uh, set up your overlay network, um, but that means that you will run into the same problems that you have in a standard v uh, uh, layer 2 network, because you still have the, all the broadcasts sending over your network, um, and that is something that you don't want. Now, for that, to solve that, you have eVPN type 2 messages. And basically, what you do on a switch is that you run a proxy ARP. Uh, it rece uh, receives the broadcast message. It translated, uh, translates it to a BGP update, and it advertises it to uh, all the listeners. Um, and it doesn't forward the broadcast message. Um, now, that saves a lot of broadcast traffic, and you can also do uh, very cool stuff like an Anycast gateway uh, to make sure that your traffic is lo uh, locally routed on that switch. Um, now, one important thing, uh, for example, is uh, the broadcast uh, suppression. Um, but you have to keep in mind if you have any legacy applications. So if you have anything that isn't uh, ARP or IPv6 neighbor discovery, uh, you have to disable your broadcast suppression. Um, now, luckily, most of the uh, traffic is uh, uh, either broadcast uh, ARP or neighbor discovery. And those, those specific proprietary uh, broadcasts, uh, you can usually contain them to one VNI, for which you then can disable the uh, broadcast suppression. Now, uh, one thing is that I said is uh, you want to move VMs from one end to, uh, to the other in your network. Now, for that, you have a Mac Mobility extension. 
which basically means that in, uh, if you uh, trigger a VM move between two hypervisors, another leaf switch will learn the MAC address, and it's simply a counter that will uh, increase um, uh, for that specific MAC address, and everyone will update their tables, and traffic is forwarded to the new destination. Now, um, uh, I quickly want to show you uh, a demo. Uh, I have uh, started up a, a VX instance with our reference topology. Uh, I hope you can uh, show, uh, see this a bit. And uh, what you basically do is you start up that uh, reference topology. Uh, you log into an out-of-band management server. And from that, you can simply uh, log into uh, one of the leaf switches. Now, what you get if you unpack and install a uh, switch from, uh, uh, from Cumulus and you install that, you basically end up in Bash, and from that you start to configure. So if you uh, want to configure a network interface, you uh, typically have to, um, have to edit a file, and you can add your uh, network configuration for each statement. Now, if I explain this to, uh, uh, to a guy with a Linux background, he's like, yeah, OK, this is great, uh, I, uh, and I can manage everything through that. Now, the problem is that uh, usually uh, I'm going to customers and I'm explaining how to move their network to a new solution. So first I'm coming with that open networking, then they have to get used to uh, spine leaf topologies, which they don't know, uh, then they have to start automating their network uh, and maybe even uh, uh, use Git, something that they don't already know. Now, that might be a step too far and, uh, for some customers. And so for that, we actually introduced a CLI. Um, yeah, it's a bit backwards, because that is something that you don't actually want to use, uh, certainly not if you have a large network. So what we did is we uh, introduced a CLI that is integrated into uh, Bash. So Every uh, command that you start with NAT, afterwards you can uh, simply configure routing and uh, interfaces uh, using that CLI. So if I uh, want to add a new uh, interface and I want to set an IP address on it, then I can simply do this. Now, at this moment, it's not applied. So uh, you first actually have to commit uh, that statement before it gets active. And I can also uh, see all the pending configurations. So in this case, it uh, uh, will add a network statement uh, for that uh, single port before I'm going uh, to commit it. Now, one thing that, um, uh, well, another vendor, uh, Juniper, is very famous about is that they have a rollback feature. Um, now, uh, that is something that we also have. So you can commit your configuration and pu uh, put a confirm behind it, which means that you actually have to do an action after your commit statement, which means that if you get disconnected or you lock yourself out, it automatically uh, rolls back. Now, what I said is that this CLI is nice, but you want to automate your network. And for that, uh, uh, we typically, uh, inside Cumulus, we use a lot of Ansible. And that gets a lot of traction in the world to uh, automate your network. So what I uh, like to see is, or what I'd like to show is a short demo uh, about that as well. Now, what I'm doing now is I'm running a small playbook. Uh, that will create a routing configuration, it will create bridges, and will make sure that also uh, two virtual servers are connected. Um, this will take about uh, a minute or so. Um, but yeah, the idea is that this configuration, this playbook, all its variables, you usually store them into Git and make sure that you can actually interact with your colleagues, track changes. Um, which is much better than something that I still see daily, is that you have some configuration in a text file that gets emailed to your colleague <coughs> uh, with no versioning. And in the end, uh, there could be a typo, because uh, your colleague is, isn't using the version um, that you have intended to, uh, to be used. Um, now, yeah, uh, I'll uh, open up the variable files in a bit. But I have to wait until it uh, has Apache installed. 
Now in this case, um, you saw the reference topology. It has four servers. Now I'm actually configuring two of them. Um, because if you get a more complex configuration, it takes even longer. Now, and in this case, you see that it just configured everything. It uh, put the configuration in it. So if I log in to that switch again, and if I use the CLI then to uh, do a show command, you simply see that there are switches configured, that there is a bridge configured, and it's ready for use in uh, just below uh, two minutes or so. Um, which makes it much more faster. Now, uh, there are several ways in how you can use Ansible. Um, and there seems to be a discussion in the, in the community what's best for network uh, configuration. Um, so we actually have both. So if you want to uh, just uh, replace your configuration files using a Jinja template, then that is uh, possible. So uh, what we have is, in this case, um, let me see. So in this case, we simply have a Jinja 2 template. And from that, you take an original configuration file. You put some if statements and for loops in it to uh, replace the configuration file that you already have. Um, now. The thing is with Jinja templates, if your configuration grows, if your network complexity uh, grows, then they can be quite complex. Now, we also have a module that uh, talks to the uh, daemon uh, behind the uh, CLI. Um, that is an option as well. Uh, you see that from several vendors that they uh, deploy a uh, module to easily configure that. Now, um, yeah, this is uh, what I'd like to uh, show today. Um, so, yeah, basically this is uh, the part of my uh, presentation. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle of the room. If you have any questions? Just line up. We have a first question. Hi. Uh, you've shared uh, how many of these things depend on NLAC or LACP to distribute the traffic. Yeah. Are there solutions that look after elephant flows and properly distribute them over the, the, the different uplinks that you have? Yeah, I've got that question from a customer before, and there are some standards that look at it, but we haven't uh, implemented any. Okay. Thank you, too. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Well, then let's have another round of applause. Okay.